On the 15th of October 2015, mother of four Michelle Dorrell confronted the UK's then Energy Secretary Amber Rudd on the BBC show Question Time, responding in tearful, betrayed tones to recently announced tax credit cuts by David Cameron's ruling Conservative Party. I voted Conservatives originally because I thought you were going to be the better chance for me and my children. You're about to cut tax credits after promising you wouldn't. I work bloody hard for my money to provide for my children, to give them everything they've got, and you're going to take it away from me and them." Doral had voted for the Tories – that's what we call the Conservatives for sure over here – in the country's then recent general election, after which she'd learnt that come next year, she'd essentially be having her benefits cut. But she'd done this in 2015. At the risk of oversimplifying things, the past few years had seen the Tories repeatedly do two things – break promises and gut social safety nets. The lead-up to the 2015 election in particular, to anyone paying attention, had laid out a fairly clear choice between the slash-slash-slash approach of the Tories and the maybe-let's-ease-off-on-all-that-slashing-soon choice their opposition offered. Then Labour leader Ed Miliband, who to this day holds the record of being the only prime ministerial candidate to be taken down by a bacon sandwich, was still a broadly neoliberal candidate, didn't even come out against austerity, but cutting £12 billion of welfare spending was literally part of the Tories' manifesto that year. To use a British expression, working mothers reliant on the sort of tax credits Doral was voting for Cameron was turkeys voting for Christmas. A roast dinner sounds awesome until you realise you're the one being roasted. That clip made quite the splash online, being shared around both by those sympathetic to Doral and by those bemused by the mother's shock that the party of austerity and spending cuts were doing austerity and spending cuts. And so, one day later, Twitter user at Cavalorn tweeted 19 words that'd go on to lodge themselves deep within the internet's vernacular. Words that'd be remembered long after Doral, those tax credit cuts, and even David Cameron himself faded from relevance. I never thought leopards would eat my face, sobs woman who voted for the leopards eating people's faces party. In the years since, Leopards Ate My Face has proved an evergreen reference point, being invoked as TERF's backed anti-feminist legislation to mock remorseful Brexiteers, and in recent times it's been directed at more than a few post-Roe v Wade right-wingers who didn't care about the dangers complications in pregnancies might pose until their pregnancies developed complications. But I don't want to talk about any of that just now. I want to talk about the new adult animation project from The Daily Wire, Mr. Bircham. Mr. Bircham is not a good show. You probably know that by now. You've probably seen plenty of examples of the show's uh, jokes. I wear the robe of the order who fought for social justice in a galaxy far, far away. Oh boy, a woke nerd. <laughs> Feels good to work up a sweat, hey boy? At home, the only part of my body that sweats is my controller phone. Thumbs don't sweat. It's like the only part of the body that doesn't sweat. Wrong. You lefties don't know what's funny. You call some lesbian talking about cancer a stand-up special. And you think NPR is LOL. <laughs> well, you've seen snippets of the utterly fantastical woke straw men the show labors to create. I found some really great school uniform options. They'll completely neutralize everyone's presentation to avoid misgendering. He grade shamed me, name shamed me, fat shamed me, screen shamed me, fashion shamed me, shame shamed me. Huh. Now playing Katy Perry's fight song. Would you like to resume your search for Nancy Pelosi bikini pics? Heck yes! Technically, it's a very amateurish project too. I don't just mean the post Brickleberry visuals here, they speak for themselves, or the vocal performances. I also mean there are some very audible line punch ins. I got my first current and only hammer. You don't know that the point of hard work, you wouldn't know an impact driver from an Uber driver. Look, maybe it's just because I'm a video essayist and I spend a lot of time editing voiceover audio, but there are so many of these moments where you can hear two takes being spliced together. Guys, just do another take. This is must-see TV. <laughs> No, no it is not. Mr. Bircham is not a good show, and there are plenty of videos out there by now that spend a lot of time getting into why. I don't want to spend ages doing that here, but I will note that the acid flip Ron Swanson protagonist kind of speaks to the ethos here as a whole. 
Mr. Bircham routinely lifts elements from better shows, but often fails to understand why these things worked well enough to be worth copying. The family guy aping cutaways cut away, sure, but things are rarely added to those visualizing segments. I'll give you an example. Dogs are supposed to eat meat. They're descendants of wolves. You ever see a vegan wolf on the Nature Channel? I'm a vegan. <laughs> Here, Bircham makes an observation. Wolves are naturally carnivores. They wouldn't have survived historically if they were vegans. And we cut away to an imagined sequence of a wolf saying he's vegan and getting eaten. There's a suspiciously similar cutaway in Family Guy, actually. Peter, thinking hard about fire trucks, recalls that they are in fact red, and we see this. Good thing I just watched that National Geographic special on fire trucks. A solitary killer, the fire truck stalks its prey. The fire truck can consume eight times its body weight. The ambulances will have to wait their turn. The joke here isn't the idea of illustrating a fire truck documentary, it's in the details of that illustration. It's the mock Attenborough accent, the humorous juxtaposition between the boxy, inflexible truck and the animalistic actions the animators have it do. So if Family Guy did the vegan wolf on the Nature Channel cutaway, Peter would say something like, Hey Lois, could you imagine seeing vegan wolves on the Discovery Channel? <laughs> and we'd likely see shots of the vegan wolf trying and failing to hold a soy latte in his big clumsy paws. Maybe him acting all grossed out by the corpse all his wolf buddies are eating, all with a parody voice voiceover or whatever. It still wouldn't be very funny, vegan jokes have been passe for about a decade now, but you can see the difference between the two, right? Using a cutaway as the bridge to a new joke, and using it to visualize one you just made. These borrowed aspects certainly bear some basic resemblance to their inspirations, but there's not really any more to it than that. It all feels very rote, very sterile. In this respect, it's curiously reminiscent of Ben Shapiro's take on Glass Onion, the one I discussed in this video a while back. It's bad conservative artists seeing form and missing everything deeper. Oh shit, Ben's an EP on this? <laughs> Who'd have thought, eh? But yeah, Mr. Bircham is not a good show. And like I said, there are plenty of videos getting into that in excruciating depth. Personally, though, I think the only thing more interesting than Mr. Bircham's curiously sterile text is its context, is the way the show's been received, because, oh boy. It's important to establish the context here. I know I have a lot of audience overlap with channels that have already covered this sort of thing, so I'll keep it brief and link more detailed recommended viewing in the description. The Daily Wire's pivot to streaming content was accompanied by an odd, seemingly contradictory promotional strategy, which simultaneously alleged the programming would be replete with conservative values, but not political, aimed at everyone. Wire CEO Jeremy Boring, speaking to Deadline in 2021, claimed, quote, Our entertainment content won't be overly political. We will make great entertainment that all Americans can enjoy, regardless of their political views. You hear that? It won't be overly political. Oh, hey, apropos of nothing, here's a clip from the show. I just don't see how you can oppose healthcare for everyone. Yeah, that's all we need, more big government. The same people that brought us the DMV and the IRS are now gonna give us a pap smear. Great plan. Face it, you voted for him because of white guilt. She assumed just because I'm black that I'd vote for a tax-raising elitist because he happens to be half black? She needs to stop watching a certain news channel and vote in her own interest. Making America great again is in my best interest. Did you just say you voted for him? I, uh, cry me a river, bitches. Trust me when I say this is one of a gazillion examples I could have played you. And that some white voters only voted for Obama because of white guilt thing isn't a one-off, by the way. The next episode implies it too. What's an integration? Other than something my pop-up was against in the 1960s. But okay, Boring says it's not political. Fine. There's even a token gay character who helpfully allows our protagonist to clarify he's not homophobic. Reyes, uniforms? I lengthen the drawstrings and reinforce the elastic in the waistband, sir. Did you just put me on uniforms because I'm gay? Yes, but you're also part of the unit. We didn't care what you did with your unit. Before doing nothing of note for the rest of the episode or ever again. Mr. Bircham's for everybody. 
At the same time as Boring's PR, though, Ben Shapiro was opening his promo piece with Andrew Breitbart's old politics is downstream of culture chestnut, explicitly framing the programming as a crucial part of the culture war. And this split image is initially perplexing, but it does make sense. The way to square these ostensibly clashing statements comes when you consider where each one was given. Seeing that the former is in deadline and Shapiro's is on the site itself, Boring's casting a wider net, appealing to those with tacit conservative sympathies who still believe or pretend to believe they're apolitical. They just don't love woke Hollywood shoving their politics down their throat. And Shapiro's upselling to the true believers, the more fervent conservatives who are beyond the need to feign centrism and who believe in the necessity of the culture war, who uncritically buy into all the woke spotting, into the minorities, gender ideology, alphabet mafia is infiltrating everything rhetoric. The rhetoric that the Daily Wire and its members have played a significant role in popularizing. The Daily Wire's content is the televisual equivalent of anti-woke beer then, mediocrity sold at a premium to consumers who want a product to perform their conservative activism for them. But as we see from Boring's statement, The Wire's still holding itself back from going all in. I think it'd be absurdly generous and a little naive to chalk this up to a crisis of conscience. No, thinking back to Shapiro's statement, it seems less like hedging and more like upholding a veneer of liberal palatability and plausible deniability. That is a side note though, again, 99% of Mr. Bircham and the PR surrounding it embraces anti-wokeness, the dog whistles, the detachment from reality. So regardless of how wider audiences are reacting to Mr. Bircham, at least the type of audience the Daily Wire has cultivated, has grown, have something for them. Something that finally, finally isn't woke. Right? <laughs> I made it to the second episode. I have zero tolerance for the LGBTQ stuff. So it's been a while since I thought I could watch a television show. And I don't know why. <laughs> I'm surprised, honestly. But I am, because they put in uh, a gay character. And... I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to watch it. All I w They have every TV show. Why not give the conservatives just one where we don't have to hear about it? Mr. Bircham is Leopards Ate My Face, the animated series, and this is why I'm talking about it. Bad comedy exists. Bad conservative comedy exists. In nearly every way, this show, even in its weakest moments, is unremarkable. But the way so much of Mr. Bircham's target audience outright rejected it is, I think, worth noting. Because that's the thing about being a leading right-wing voice from the post-Gamergate anti-SJW era through to today's woke-spotting Great Replacement light period. That's the thing about convincing mass audiences that the mere presence of minorities in a piece of media reveals a degenerate political sickness in modern Hollywood. It doesn't matter how many culture war strawmen you slam dunk. Mr. Carponzi has banned your safety film because of its highly problematic content. It doesn't matter how many conservative slogans you slyly reference. Wood doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't matter how much court patriotism you whack in there. I'm teaching kids how to build things while I'm building their character. <laughs> That's what America is all about. Or how many feeble, right-coded soapboxes you have your protagonist climb on. The point of hard work is that it's hard and it's work. You want everything to be easy and comfortable. None of that matters because there's a gay character. Worse, a gay character who isn't explicitly condemned. And that means it's woke. It doesn't even matter if it is transparently tokenistic, a strategic settlement that allows The Wire to feign openness and better advance the culture war. Hey, our show's for everyone, this five second clip proves it, now watch our propaganda. No, character is gay, so show is woke. The Daily Wire has fallen, billions must die. But the well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions of all this doesn't end at woke spotting friendly fire. There is more, for instance, Okay, Ben Shapiro is Jewish, right? For all his faults, Ben is not a neo-Nazi. Ben likes to dehumanize based on ethno-religious grounds, sure, but to his credit, Ben, and by extension the Daily Wire, are not neo-Nazis. These guys may actively reject neo-Nazis, but 
the thing about alliances of convenience to prominent alt-right figures, the thing about collaborating now and then with people who do skew a lot nearer that label, the thing about having chosen culture war teammates who are less concerned with rejecting neo-Nazis, is that the space you help take in each culture war crusade gets filled, in part, by people who don't want you to exist. And your fellow alt-right institutions will not come to your support. One of the most important early Nazis was a man named Ernst Röhm. He led their first paramilitary, helped Hitler get into power, they were buddies. But Röhm was growing too influential, Röhm was taking the socialist part of National Socialism a little too seriously for the Führer, and Röhm was gay. And so, he was killed, purged from party history, and his sexuality was leaked as justification. Fascism is a very cannibalistic mindset. The moment a partnership stops being beneficial, that partner becomes a fall guy. The in-group shrinks. The leopards eating people's faces movement loved you when you helped them get into office, but the moment you're worth more to them as a target, that's all you are. Looking back, it doesn't feel quite right that this image, the leopards eating people's faces party maniacally having their own voters' faces gnawed off, started with Michelle Dorrell. That seems a rather ill-fitting origin for the meme. To me, the phrase always had a viciousness to it beyond tax credit cuts. I don't want to downplay the impact of Tory austerity in the 2010s. Go tell the millions of kids who grew up in poverty during those years that Cameron's economic policy wasn't savage in its way and see how that goes for you, but the political episode that drove Cavalon to tweet those 19 words reads as surprisingly lightweight, or at least somewhat unremarkable. Neoliberal business as usual, when held up against the type of story the memes invoked for these days. Again, Michelle Dorrell's Question Time appearance was in 2015, the year before two of the modern Anglosphere's weightiest votes, a time before we crossed the ecological point of no return, and when the long-term impacts of social media algorithms and online disinformation were only beginning to be seen. It was a time when liberal democracy simply had a cough, not a novel coronavirus. A time when we all agreed vaccines were good. A time when the US president had healthy cognitive functions, and when his opponents weren't openly planning to seize dictatorial powers. This sense of a premature birth is visible in the flourishing online afterlife of Cavalon's words. The now gigantic Leopards Ate My Face subreddit opened its virtual doors in 2017, and gained traction mainly with stories of remorseful Trumpers and Brexiteers. The top post of all time shows Mark Wayne Mullen, one of the Republican congressmen who pushed to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election, cowering in the Senate House as rioting conservatives broke into the Capitol in an attempt to interrupt the certification of President Biden's victory. There is savagery here, violence, threat to life, there's the sense of fickle political allegiances, there's raw fascistic fervor. It sort of feels like that tweet was made for a moment like this. And commenters agreed. Difficult to get any more r slash leopards ate my face than this, one writes. You win the sub, offers another. But Nobody's winning here, right? Directly above that comment, another user writes, This would be hilarious if it wasn't so depressing. People often link this meme, Leopards Ate My Face, to the idea of Schadenfreude, a German word denoting pleasure felt at another's failure or suffering. But who was happy watching the news on January 6th? And where was the pleasure exactly in the sight of a hard-working mother realising on national TV that she'd been fooled, tearful at the prospect of even more cuts, even less money for her children's food? Just as there was no schadenfreude there, I see none in the far-right responses to Mr. Bircham. I think it's sobering to see how fast a radicalised audience will turn on their own. I think it's chilling to see Nazis hurl anti-Semitism at the voices that perhaps accidentally helped them regain the space to do so publicly. Yeah, sure, there is an irony there, but I don't like it. I don't like seeing Nazis. Why are there Nazis on Twitter now? Why are they just allowed to be there? <clears throat> It would be a stretch to call the sad, feeble story of Mr. Bircham, its creation, its content, and its reception, an important one. It's always annoying when some hack video essayist makes a mountain out of a molehill because doing so gives them an easy conclusion. But I think the show is just about notable as an example of all this. So maybe we shouldn't be laughing at it, or at least, maybe we shouldn't just be laughing at it.
A few hours after that photo was snapped, Mark Wayne Mullen was on the news blaming the putsch attempt on Antifa. Two years after, he was elected senator. Because even when the Leopards Eating People's Faces party does eat the face of someone who voted for them, that doesn't bring the party down. And that's kind of the whole point to the meme, right? The rest of their base keeps on voting. If they survive, sometimes that now faceless voter does too. Fancy that, we're at the end of the video, but what a wild ride it's been, eh? If you're not quite ready to get off it, there's an end note up on my Patreon page with a cut section of this video's script that I nixed to help with flow, all about why real Ron Swanson works and this guy doesn't, which you can see from as little as £2 a month, along with a truckload of other bonus stuff. Thanks for watching, anyhow, and an extra special thank you as always to everyone helping the channel continue to exist on Patreon and with a YouTube membership, especially Hanan, Daniel Goldhorn, Magath, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy. Bye.